Uh, go to Luke 22. Go to Luke 22. It's a famous passage, Luke 22, verse 30, 39. Luke 22 and verse 39. Luke 22 and verse 39. I'm going to put this out of the way. Don't want anything of the world on this pulpit. All right. Luke 22, verse 39. The Bible reads, And he came out and went as he walked to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray. He entered not into temptation, and he was withdrawn from them, stones cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There appeared an angel. Now, Garden of Gethsemane, Mount of Olives, Jesus Christ is he's sweating great drops of blood, man. He knows exactly what's going to happen in this, in this couple hours. And he's praying, God, Please get this cup far away from me. He knows the terror. He knows what's going to happen. And you know what he's doing? He's, he wants his friends, his closest friends, to pray for him, right? He's like, guys, please don't enter into temptation. And what do they do? They fall into temptation. And at this moment, a miracle happens for Jesus, and it's amazing. And this miracle, what happens is that an angel from heaven had descended, as the Bible says, strengthening him. And brethren, when you find that word, right, strengthening, you know what it means? It means to exhort. Okay, it means to exhort. Now, there, may, there have been many of God's children praying like Jesus Christ, you know, begging God to take some trial, some tribulation, something that's in their life. And they're maybe not sweating grape drops of blood, but it feels like that they are to themselves. And uh, brethren, you know, in this time or in that moment, you know, they need somebody. And but you know what helped the Lord Jesus to get through it? Even though it was just a little bit of help, an angel came and comforted him and, ex- and strengthened him and exhorted him. And even though he couldn't necessarily bear the burden, I can imagine him saying this, even though I cannot bear the burden for you, I will surely help you by exhorting you to get through it. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we need that for each other. Yeah. You know, sometimes we may think that we're strong when really we're not. And we tend to think that, oh, you know, I read, I, I pray, I must be a strong Christian. Well, no. I mean, last time I checked, God is the one strengthening you. Like what the brother mentioned about, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is the part that strengthens you, not yourself. Now, have any of you done exactly that for a brother and sister in Christ? Have you truly exhort them, help them in any way? Even telling them, hey, you're going to get through this. I know you will. It may seem blim, but you're going to get through it. That's good. No matter what. Even the devil comes right at you. Even if he brings all his legions, he's going to, you're going to definitely going to get, get through it. And if you haven't, then I hope this message will help you understand how serious it is to exhort people and to really get behind the brethren. And yes, even your pastor. Yes. Can I say that again? Even yes, your pastor. Oh. Okay, the top of my message today is an example of exhortation at Gethsemane. An example of exhortation at Gethsemane. I'm going to pray real quick. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for allowing me to preach here, Lord. Thank you, Father, uh, for the privilege, Lord. And, and uh, God, it's kind of, it really is a little scary to get to behind this pulpit because so many men of God preach behind there, Lord. And God, I don't, even though none of us are worthy to preach, I, I, God, I especially feel that way. And, and God, I pray, Lord, that it's not of me, Lord, but it's of you today, Lord Father. And please be in the message, Lord, and God, my lips. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so my first point is an example of dread at Gethsemane. Okay, an example of dread at Gethsemane. So at verse 39 it reads, And he came out and went, as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Here is God manifested in the flesh, praying that this cup, Lord, please just take it from me. I, don't, I do not want it. And yet, the Lord Jesus tells his friends to, stop, to not stop praying for him at, his time, at, at, this, at this time, because he knows soon exactly what's going to happen, and he needs every bit of prayer on him. 
But what happens to those helpful friends, you know, those faithful people that, you know, I'll buy you to the end? Well, you go to verse 45 down in, in uh, Luke 22, it reads, And when he rose up from prayer and was comes to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Now, have you ever told anybody that you would pray for them and that you would truly be there for them? Like, oh, yeah, you know, I got you. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll help you. And instead, you completely forget about it. Or even worse, this is way worse. If you let the temptation that the devil threw at you and you, and you succumb to it, and then you give an excuse to not help that brother and sister that needs you the most, if that's ever happened to you, then I hope this mess, you hear this message. Because this is a really, this is a huge problem in churches. It is a really huge problem. God forbid that you're like these brothers in the garden when Jesus told them, hey, you know, I, I need you guys to, to man up. I need you to sit here and pray for me. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen, but I need you to pray right now. Please do it. I have an unspoken prayer request. Please do this. Please pray. And the disciples, oh, yeah, 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 we got you. You know, uh, you want to get us your favorite food, Lord, from Mama's house? Do you want to go, uh, you know, get you to play, play a hymn or something? We'll do it for you. And, you know, I can imagine, you know, Peter being like, oh, yeah, prayer all night. Oh, it's easy, man. Come on. You know, Bartholomew, I mean, yeah, he's a good prayer warrior, but me, mm-mm, I'm really eloquent. I can really get into God. And what happened? You know, uh, what, what, is, uh, what does the Lord find? You know, snoring louder than the crow that's going to crock thrice before Peter denies the Lord. Now, and rightfully so, the Lord says in verse 46, he says, and said unto them, this, this is Jesus Christ, he says unto the disciples, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now go to Mark 14. Mark 14. Mark 14 and verse 39. Mark 14 and verse 39. Okay. Okay, the scripture reads, Mark 14, verse 39. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, neither was they want to answer him. And he cometh the third time and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, you know what's interesting with this scenario? The Lord Jesus tells his disciples to pray, right? And they don't. I mean, they, they fell asleep. They fell into temptation. Now, what I find interesting about this passage, I'm going to do a little uh, Max O'Neill perversion of this, of the scripture. Okay, so bear with me here. Okay. Imagine, you know, let's say this happened to you. Let's say that you told a brother, yeah, I'll do this for you. I'll, I'll help you. And, uh, you know, yeah, amen. You know, I'll pray for you. And you don't. Well, this, this might happen. Uh, this may be over-exaggeration, but this could happen in this life because it's not a game we play in. This is a real spiritual life. We go against the devil and his dominions. Okay? Now imagine the scripture said this. Okay? This was you. If you denied that brother in helping him. Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour come. Behold, your brother is smitten by the wiles of the devil and has fallen. Behold, thou art the man that could have helped thy brother. People, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We need a bit of every exhortation we can get from each other. Okay? It's serious. This is a very, very serious thing. You know, it may... Sometimes it may feel like, oh, he's always asking for this, or she's always asking for this. Well, you know, if you're having that mentality, then right. I, I, I really might want to check your heart. Yeah. Because if you consider yourself strong, then you got to buckle up and help the brother and sister right. in Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen, brother. That's good. Now, I hope you understand how serious this is for this example. And luckily, I have an example for you to follow in this scripture. And that's actually my second point, is an example of help at Gethsemane. An example of help at Gethsemane. Back to Luke 22. Luke 22. Yeah. Luke 22 and verse 43. Luke 22 and verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, and strengthening him. Here as we have the Lord Jesus is praying earnestly, an angel from heaven comes down 
and exhorts our Savior. Now, what blows my mind away is that just like the Lord Jesus Christ, you, in, in, that, in that situation, you can be that angel for that person that's struggling. Okay? You can be that person. God is telling you, there's a reason why he has an angel coming down there to show you an example that, yes, even though Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and yes, uh, all things are by him and through him, he still needs to be comforted. He still needs to have some exhortation. And to him, an angel coming down to him was what he needed. And you can be that angel to that person. Now, I hope that makes you realize the severity, the purity, and also the seriousness of exhorting people. When all of us have forsaken and forgotten that individual suffering, you could be the one that gives those encouraging words to that person to keep pushing forward in their Christian life. Go to Hebrews 3. Go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, and go to verse 13. Yep, amen. Hebrews 3, verse 13. The scripture reads, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Yes, it is. It's today, not tomorrow, not, not next week, not the week after that, but today is the day to exhort one another. Yeah. If you're not careful, you will become hardened and right. stubborn to the point to where, just like the verse says, deceitfulness of sin will come in and you'll just start neglecting the brethren. Wow. When you are that person that can help people in the church, give encouragement to them that are weak and strengthen those that are not strong. Again, if you consider yourself strong in this church right now, then, okay, it's your time to give some of yourself to the brethren. It's about time. You know, you've taken, taken, taken. Now it's time to give. Go to uh, Jude. Go to Jude. I'm going to expound on this a little bit. Go to Jude and verse 3. Jude, verse 3. Jude and verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all... I love Paul. Not Paul. Uh, I, it's funny, whenever you read uh, Corinthians, uh, you know, he says, uh, Dearly beloved, and you can tell when he's being sarcastic. Um, all right, uh, verse, verse 3 uh, in Jude. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once, uh, once delivered unto the saints. Jew knows the seriousness of the life that the saints must endure. So he writes to them in this epistle to exhort them and to keep them from falling away. Because if you read the epistle, if you read it before, you notice that later on as he writes, there are other saints that have already fallen out. They're already out. Okay, so that's why it's so imperative for a believer, especially a new believer that just got into Christ and is you know, winning and is trying to do something for the Lord. It's very important that you encourage that person. Because as soon as the devil loses somebody, he's going to try to, in some way, shape, or form, have them fall. And yes, they're saved, they're going to heaven. But if he can make that person live like the devil, then he will surely do it. That's why it's important to always encourage each other, even if you've been in the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years. You still need it. Amen. Now, oh, there we go. I would... If I was one of these brothers and sisters that Jude was writing to, I would not only be appreciative for him telling me this, because he wants the best for my relationship with Jesus Christ and with the Lord, but also keep telling me to keep going in the faith. That's, that's really important. Imagine what the angel was saying to Christ. You know, I can imagine a little bit. I can see something like this. This is what he was saying, maybe is that you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. All things are possible to him that believeth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by you. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your words shall not pass away. Amen. That's exactly what we need to do for each other. I mean, we all know that Jesus Christ is, is a man of all men. Like, let's be honest here. But even then, you know, he still needs something. He needs somebody to help him. At least get some encouraging words. And that's what I think the angel was telling him. To remind him, look, what you're going to go through, no other man is going to be able to, to even come close to taking. 
but you can do it. You're the only one that can do it. And that's really, that's really encouraging in that time and moment, especially you know the severity of what's going to happen. Now, you have an examples, and you see them. And what I want to do for this third point, uh, it's kind of more of an, a uh, call to action, and it's an example for you at Gethsemane. Okay, there's an example for you at Gethsemane. Uh, now, I hope you realize how serious this is because some of you really do have a gift of exhorting. Like you really do in this building right now. And I'm not saying that to puff you up, but you really do have a gift of knowing when, and you know who you are. You know when to exactly say the right words at the right time to that person that they need to hear. And that's a gift. Like, God knows that that is desired in all churches throughout, not just this country, but throughout the whole world. And if you're that person, you need to step up because that's a ministry, right? That is something that we all need to pray for because we all need that. Go to Romans 12. Go to Romans 12. Romans 12. Yeah. Romans 12, look at verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. It says, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Having then gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And if you go down to verse 21, it says, Be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. This passage, of course, is talking about the many members in, in Christ. Right. And it's talking about the measures of faith uh, determined by, by the gifts. But I would like to point out something here is that, which should be eye-opening to you, is that when Paul mentions verse 21 at the end of the chapter where it says, uh, be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. Brethren, if you are able to exhort somebody here in this church and you know what to say to them and what they need to hear, the Bible clearly states to fight against evil, which would be, for example, oh, I hate that guy. I don't even want to even talk to him. That's an evil. That's something that's going to have you not to do the good. Instead, what you need to do is do the good, which would be, even though I don't like the brother, even I don't want to even want to look at him, I don't even want to even think about him, I'm going to go help him. I'm going to go give him what he needs. I know exactly that he's going through X, Y, and Z. I've been through that. I know how he feels. I'm going to give him some advice. And scripture clearly says, go do that. Right. You know, it, it's amazing how like we, we, we tend to forget that, that we, we're a family. You know, I mean, yeah, sure, we may have differences, but as a family, we got to stick with each other. And I hope it doesn't get to a point like most churches where it's all politic and, you know, people, oh. people do certain things to appease other people yeah. so they can get this or get that. And like, no, man, it should be out of the heart willingly. Yeah. Amen, brother. Go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, verse 19. Yeah. Proverbs 18, verse 19. Eighteen, verse 19. Proverbs 18, verse 19. The Bible reads, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. That'll preach right there. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Brothers and sisters, your tongue can save somebody's walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe even their life themselves. You know, we don't need a Pharisee coming in here and acting like they're a big shot. We don't need that. We got people here suffering, dying, we need people that need spiritual feeding. We don't need some kind of dude coming in here saying he's all that in a bag of chips and really he's not. We need each other. And whether you want to admit it or not, sorry, you need each other. <laughs>
If you let yourself be bitter and angry at that person you have disdain towards, then that not only is it going to ruin your, your walk, it's going to ruin theirs in some way. Because sin is not fair. Sin is not fair. It won't affect, it's not going to just affect you, it's going to affect everyone you love. And yes, sometimes, maybe you'll like this part, it'll affect the ones you hate. Which, if that's the case, then God help you. God help you. One day at the judgment seat of Christ, when we're all judged for our works, the Lord will show you what that person, who you cannot stand at all, you can't even bear to look at or talk to, was going through, and what you could have said to them that could have helped them going before they left the faith, or perhaps they were called home. Just imagine that. You know, like, there's light right here. You know, just imagine God looking down at you, and he says, okay, here's this point where you, uh, they needed to hear this, and I put on your heart to say what I wanted you to say, and you didn't do it. Why? Oh, like, his teaching was too hard. I didn't like what he was saying. I like that pastor, even though he looks kind of gay, but it's okay. And you're like, well, okay, that's then. But I wanted you to help your brother or sister in Christ right now. And what did you do? You neglected them. I don't know what you're going to say in that moment, but, you know, I'll be praying for you if you're that person, especially today. Um, Oh, wow, man, I'm, I'm actually running it by on time. Uh, <laughs> real quick, go to, go to Colossians. Let's play this real quick. Go to Colossians. Just want to preach on this real quick, and then we'll close. Colossians 3, verse 13. Kind of going hand in hand with exhorting. Colossians 3, verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And like what the, what the little brother just said on the verses. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Brothers and sisters, I understand if you got something deep against uh, somebody in here or online. But listen, man, if you want to just serve God faithfully and really just be a blessing to people you got to be able to put all of that hate all of that whatever you got and put on the blood and just serve god i understand like it's weird man because you know we're in the last days doesn't doesn't god tell us to stick together and you're getting bit over something that's not even worth even mentioning like at all that doesn't make sense like we should all be sticking to each other, no matter what you, uh, no matter what you went through, no matter what you say. Like even if somebody says something offensive to you, if you can just figure it out on your own and get right with the brother, and then when the brother or sister needs your help, you can then help them instead of being bitter against them. So now we have all these examples of Gethsemane, and now we have to apply it to your life. Simple as that. You've got to be able to take uh, what the scripture says, and if you're willing to do it, then amen, and if not, then I hope to God that he'll have mercy on you and that you'll get right with God. All right.